Hey everybody, this is Tatiana Moroz and welcome to the Grandma's House edition of the Tatiana Show. We're broadcasting to you live from New Jersey. Uh, you can see I have beautiful artwork provided by my grandmother. And um, we're broadcasting out on Liberty.me and also on Let's Talk Bitcoin. And today I'm joined with some unusual guests. Uh, we have Shaban from Spells of Genesis and we have Eric Voorhees. Now, while I have a lot in common probably with Eric, uh, ideologically, the whole video game thing is a little bit confusing. But one of the cool things about Bitcoin is that you get to learn about things that you don't know about. And I certainly think that the Spells of Genesis game is using Bitcoin in a really innovative way. They're also, um, I think that you guys are doing something with Tokenly too, right? Is that correct, Shaban? Yeah, correct. We're using the swap bot from Tokenly and uh, it works pretty amazingly. Awesome. So why don't you guys say hello to the audience, give a little bit of background for yourself. A lot of my audience already knows about Bitcoin, but some of them doesn't. So, you know, give them a little bit of background on you and then we can go from there. Perfect. So uh, thank you, Tatiana, for uh, the invitation. Thank you for uh, joining us. I'm uh, Shaban Shame, I'm the founder of Evertrimsoft, a um, company founded uh, five years ago um, doing mobile game, basically, uh, iPhone, Android games in general, and software in general as well. Um, so we were pretty uh, early in the, in, in, the vi in the video game industry, and um, uh, in the mobile video game industry, and uh, now we are shifting to uh, to Bitcoin because there is uh, innovation in that field, and it's where there is a big opportunity in the market. Um, and uh, we started to work on the blockchain, and we start thinking, why don't uh, we put our uh, game asset on the blockchain to allow people to um, to allow people to uh, have full ownership of what they purchase, because when you purchase something in a uh, in a in a video game, um, you don't really own it. So thanks to the blockchain technology, now we can shift to uh, something where you can own uh, your uh, your assets. Okay, so there's a lot of questions that I have with that, but let's bring Eric in and then we can kind of get into the nitty gritty of it. Eric? Yeah, uh, so I'm Eric Voorhees. Uh, I've, I've been involved in Bitcoin for quite a while. Uh, started a number of Bitcoin companies and I am currently the, shape, the, uh, the CEO of Shapeshift.io, which is a instant exchange for digital assets. So we, we help people who have one kind of digital currency or asset uh, convert it to a different kind uh, without having to sign up or log in or do anything complicated. We're sort of like the Google Translate of uh, currency exchange. So um, I had the pleasure of meeting Shaban a little, you know, a couple months ago, and we are helping, Shapeshift is helping uh, Shaban and his company with their sale of the tokens in his game. Um, I'm quite excited about what they're doing, basically putting these digital game assets onto the blockchain. I think it's, uh, it's re very novel, and so we're, we're happy to help them get started with that. Um, and it fits really well into our business model of helping people buy you know, any kind of popular digital token. Um, so that's, that's what we're up to. Yeah, we've been using Shapeshift. I'm also doing uh, Tatiana Coin on Tokenly, and we've been testing the, the store, which has been working really well, and we're also doing Shapeshift, so that's kind of a cool thing. Um, Okay, so when you talk about people getting to own their digital assets, now how does that, how did it work previously and how does it work now? Um, as an example, um, we release uh, Munga, who's a trading card game uh, for five years. Um, and in Munga, like in any other game, we store users' possession in the database. So um, when someone purchases uh, a card or, um, or something in a game, we store that in our database. 
and we allow player to um, trade uh, inside the game with um, a digital currency. Uh, we call it. Um, um, uh, <laughs> I, I forgot, uh, silver coin uh, and copper coin and they can um, trade these assets in the game within our database. So um, this uh, it happens that some players started to trade those cards even outside the game for real money. So what they, what they did is um, Jack contacted John and say hey uh, I want to sell this card for real money, so uh, let me send you real money over PayPal, and then let's make a transaction inside the game um, uh, using a very tiny fraction of the uh, game currency. And um, so it it was kind of black black market uh, trading. And when something goes wrong, they just contacted our support and say, hey, this guy stole my car, stole my account. Uh, see, uh, he did a trade to himself with a very small fraction of, uh, of game currency. So um, there was um, uh, like a trading market uh, inside the game. So instead of trying to, uh, to, to stop this completely, uh, we decided to uh, empower it. So with um, the uh, the block blockchain technology, you can have full ownership of your card, and then you can even trade these cards, these game assets, outside the game um, on the blockchain, and um, no one can refrain you on doing that. And what we simply do with the game, instead of having this data of what, who owns what on our database, we just listen to the blockchain. So the um, player gives us his public address, and we look at what are the items that are on this public address. And according to the, um, the uh, tokens in this, in this address, it will unlock uh, cards and character and power in the game. Do they ever um, get their winnings in Bitcoin? Aside from the card element, do they ever win Bitcoin for getting to the next level or anything like that? Um, this is uh, something um, that we are thinking of in Spells of Genesis. It's not um, officially announce or planned, but um, it could be interesting for for a player to be able to get some rewards. It can be rewards from a tournament or success uh, in Bitcoin, and it can be also reward for progression. What we need to carefully do is um, make a difference between um, gambling game and uh, non-gambling game. So basically, um, it's not a game where you play to win money or to get money, but it's a game where you can purchase thing and this thing retain their value, and you can uh, transfer uh, sell to uh, to other player. So it's something we will um, definitely think of. This is, uh, let me just jump in real quick. This is sort of a, a problem or a dynamic that's existed for a long time in the video game world, which is that whenever there are sort of rare items in the game that people want, um, people always find a way to trade them outside of the game. It's almost always against the terms of service for the game, you know, whether it's World of Warcraft or something. Um, but if you have a magic sword in World of Warcraft that other people want and they're willing to pay real money, people typically find a way to do that. Um, and often is a really awkward kind of transaction, both because the form of payment, you know, it's often done with PayPal, which is always reversible, so that's prone to fraud. But also then there's no, there's no real mechanism to do it within the game um, very well. So what Shaban and those guys are doing is very cool. They're basically saying, look, these digital assets in the game, um, we will make them as real as Bitcoins are in that they exist on the blockchain and if you buy one, 
not only do you own it in the game, but you possess it as a real item. And as a real item, you can send it to other people and trade with them very easily. And I think it's going to be the, the genesis of a whole, a whole world of digital assets that become real things that people buy and sell and, and have, digital commodities. And Bitcoin sort of showed the first, the first way that that can work with the blockchain. And now all these other, uh, all these other realms can start utilizing that technology. Um, so uh, I, I think in 10 years, this is going to be really common to see. And uh, Shaban is basically pioneering it. Shaban, can you tell me a little bit about exactly how the game works? I mean, is it Legends of Zelda? Is it a strategy game the same way that World of Warcraft is? Who who would want to play this other than guys that are hanging out in basements? So, uh, Spells of Genesis, our new game, is what we call an like, uh, arcade RPG game. So, um, it's a little bit more casual than our former game. Um, the Munga was more strategic um, or a little, a little bit more geeky. Spells of Genesis is uh, easier. So it's an arcade game where you see enemies in the field and you have to shoot at these, these enemies. A little bit like in a pool, uh, you shoot your bow uh, onto, onto the enemy and try to, uh, to destroy it. It's very easy, say said like that, but there is um, uh, some um, feature of strategy because some enemies are strong uh, against some uh, elements. So when you shoot your bolts, when you shoot your characters, your orb, you have to choose the right character uh, that will deal the right damage to the enemy. You have to choose carefully which enemy you want to uh, to hit first because he will have uh, some and some uh, impact on your uh, on the gameplay. So there is literally literally uh, unlimited possibility um, in uh, in the enemies and in the characters. So that's why it's important and the collection aspects come into play. Because you might try to collect um, characters that have specific powers uh, that will help you through the game. So some character will have um, powers that others don't have, and you will need those specific character to uh, finish a quest or um, achieve some specific thing. Um, but you're playing against people all around the world. Yes, you're playing against people all around the world, and you're also uh, playing against the computer, a little bit like uh, Candy Crush, if I, uh, if I can uh, make an analogy where uh, you try to beat the level and progress as, uh, as much as possible. And do, you get, do you get to choose who you're going to be? I mean, can you choose somebody that kind of looks like you isn't... In, as an avatar, or you just assign somebody. Um, so there, there is some uh, customization, of course. So you have your own, um, let's say, profile, and uh, you can customize your avatar. And avatar are also digital assets, so you can collect also avatar and trade avatar. Um, you have also different um, different stuff that you can uh, personalize in your profile. So, for example, your background page, or um, or uh, things that you can uh, make uh, on your own taste. Uh, something we're exploring as well is allowing people to create their own content. So, let's say you know how to draw. You draw uh, really nice or you feel like a game designer, um, we can imagine that you create your own character, so um, using one of your creations. And then you give uh, your character some characteristic, and then you can um, try uh, go out and try to sell your character um, to other people, or you can give your character uh, to uh, some friends or people who will um, who will like it. 
Or you can also imagine to create levels, so um, what we call user-generated content. So you can create uh, some, um, some game content levels and transform that as a token uh, that you create. And then you are free to uh, dispose uh, of your token the way, uh, the way you like. So we can imagine to have a Tatiana level, for example, and people who own uh, Tatiana coin uh, can play these levels, for example. Okay, so they basically have to rock really, really hard in order <laughs> to do <Yeah>. it. <laughs> um, okay, do other... How, first of all, how do you control quality? I guess maybe the answer to that would be the market. And then are other games doing stuff where you can just build stuff and then potentially... I mean, it's almost... I'm very unfamiliar with open source only from Bitcoin, but it almost sounds like an open source game that people can be building additional stuff on there. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, it's not completely open source. Um, since the, uh, the game engine is developed uh, internally, um, but what is open is um, what, what we can say level creation. So we allow within the game to um, to create some parts that are open, so not everything is open, but part of it. But have other games done that before? And does the um, financial incentive, I guess, make people want to make um, new levels and new characters and stuff? Um, I, I will say yes. Uh, it has been made, um, and people. Uh, uh, like to do it, and usually they do really nice uh, things and creation. In many games, um, you can have um, you, what we call user-generated content, but it was never in the blockchain, um, never controlled by the blockchain, so it's always only internally in the system and people are not making it commercially, uh, usually, because um, it's internal in the game, and the game don't want to be um, um, a transmitter or a platform that's, um, that is uh, selling things to, uh, to the end user. Um, so, Can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Um, to give a little context, in this industry. I saw an article a few weeks ago about a, a Counter-Strike. Uh, Counter-Strike is a very popular computer game, and this one uh, company, it's, I think it was like one or two guys, they sell skins for the guns, so little basically like designs for the guns that people have. Just completely aesthetic, totally digital, not, not quote-unquote real at all, and th they were making $10,000 a day in revenue selling these things. And this is by far, you know, not the only, not the only outfit in town. So, when when these games hit millions of people, um, it doesn't take, you know, a large percentage spending too much money before the numbers start to get really significant. And this is in the world where buying those skins, um, they're not really they're not really digital assets in the way that that a Bitcoin is. And now with what Shaban is doing, game assets can be uh, can exist on the blockchain. So imagine how much more demand there would be for special um, skins for weapons if you could transfer those skins to other people, you would know exactly how many of those skins existed and it was mathematically you know, provable, um, you knew exactly how scarce it was, and then you, you, know, you could transfer these things between games. I think, um, I think there's a lot of potential here. I think I'm beginning to understand why people care about this. Um, it is definitely sounds really compelling. Could somebody use one of their items in a different game if other games started using this as a model? Let's say a different game, completely different company, was also using... What, what would they use? Would they use Counterparty? Would they use Bitcoin? Would I, they be able to use their item from Spells of Genesis in their Darth Vader game or whatever if they built it on... Uh, Ethereum, I mean, where do those things cross over? And actually, would Shapeshift help with that? Well, actually, there's a really... I just kind of thought of something. Not only can people use the, the items in Shaban's game in other games by Shaban, but even without his permission, 
other game developers can create games that people can use those assets in, and Shaban has zero control over it because they are assets on the counterparty blockchain. Right? Why are so giving block- these people this idea? You're ruining the game for Shaban. <laughs> well, it does no. It makes those items worth more. Basically, if if some if if some item in Shaban's game becomes really popular and worth a lot, some other company can make a game that supports that asset as well, and now people can transfer that thing over to that to that company and vice versa. So and and Sh- Shaban can't control that. It, that's that's what makes these things real assets. Is that once someone possesses them, they have full authority to hold it, to destroy it, to send it to someone else anywhere in the world for any purpose whatsoever. So there, I think all sorts of really interesting uses are going to come out of it. Um, wouldn't that cut Shaban out of it, and wouldn't he be mad? What if I mean? What if what if I made my own um, you know sword? Shape like guitar on Siobhan's game, which of course I'm capable of doing. Uh, and then I went to somewhere else. You know, I'd be A, exiting the game, and then B, he wouldn't make any money off of it because I had created my own item. I mean, that's, that's probably good for the user, but not good for the game developer. Or am I looking a, at that wrong? That's a very mercantilist view, Tatiana. <laughs> Basically, if, if, um, if people are taking items from Siobhan's game and going to other games to play with them, uh, if Shaban's making good games, other people are going to bring those assets over to his game as well. So you can think of it sort of like f- free trade, right? Uh, ultimately, it should be a net benefit to everyone that's making useful, interesting entertainment. And uh, I, I think, you know, a, a lot of the items will get sold by the creator. Um, and once they're sold, the money from the, the creation and sale has already been made. So it doesn't necessarily even matter if if the special sword leaves Shaban's game and goes somewhere else. Uh, and indeed, ha- if that sword leaves Shaban's game, now the ones that remain in that universe have become more valuable there, right? So there's a whole mm-hmm. supply and demand aspect to this thing. Yes, and I guess uh, there is something very interesting here um, behind your question. We can imagine uh, in the future uh, IP owner um, let's say uh, Harry Potter, for example. Um, you can imagine someone, the IP owner, issuing, um, I don't know, a 1,000 Harry Potter character uh, as a token. And um, people who use the token might use the character in a game. For example, a game designer can say, okay, I accept this character and I will put it in my game. And actually, the one who make the money is the IP owner because he sold um, the uh, IP of the character Harry Potter, and the game designer just used this um, this uh, character, this IP, and he didn't make money out of the uh, character itself. So I can imagine me as an IP owner issuing um, um, license to my character to be used in several different uh, game or product or whatsoever. What if they use that character for evil? You know, something that's completely antithetical to Harry Potter. Um, Would the IP Mm -hmm. owner even have any control over that? That's a pretty good question. As it's uh, unseen yet, um, uh, it's hard to uh, hard to say. But we can imagine that the IP owner put a set of rules um, where, if you are using the image, the uh, related to the character, uh, you have to comply to a, a certain set of rules. But uh, it's a completely new ground here, and everything has to be uh, to uh, to be built. But um, this is the doors that those dig- digital asset opens, actually. Yeah, actually, if you if you combine this concept with with the smart contracts on something like Ethereum, and with prediction markets like Augur, you can actually basically create terms of use for digital assets. Uh, and if uh, someone uses that asset and breaks certain terms, if the community is voting on that and observing it, like through Augur or through the prediction market, that can all be enforced through contracts. And someone who bought an asset and violated its terms could then lose the asset according to the, the contract's terms. Uh, very sci-fi stuff and probably a little ways away, but totally possible now with the platforms that are getting built. 
So, Eric, your interest in this is that if you get in on the early game with this, Shapeshift could make a killing, right? I would think so because is anybody else helping to facilitate these, um, I don't know what you would call them. I, I don't even know. Like sale of avatars? What are they? Tokens? I mean, I don't even know what they are. What are they? I like, I like calling them digital assets, but it's not a super graceful term. But yeah, we, you know, Shapeshift is trying to be the easy exchange for digital assets. So we benefit when there are more digital assets than when they are used in more in a wider array of things. So if if the only digital asset in the world is Bitcoin that people use for money, uh, Shapeshift doesn't really serve a purpose. But if there are dozens of digital assets of all different kinds, some we can conceive of today and many that we can't even conceive of, um, people want to trade those things. And so Shapeshift uh, has, a, has a good place for that. So something like uh, bit crystals and the specific cards in Spells of Genesis, uh, that's great for our platform because that shows that not only can people trade currencies on blockchains, but now they can actually trade game items. And there will be many more branches of this technology that, that grow as well. What other gamification through Bitcoin has been um, in the community? I know my friend Kingsley, he has uh, Leetcoin, which he's been working on for a while. How do you differentiate what you guys are doing with the other projects? And are there ways that you guys can play nice together, or how does that work? You mean Shapeshift, or...? Uh, no, I mean other, other products that are using Bitcoin in the game. For example, uh, Leetcoin I couldn't even speak to, but for example, there's something called Bitlanders, which used to be the old film annex. And it's basically a social media platform where for answering questions or doing more posts or engaging, you're basically earning Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other projects similar to Bitlanders? I mean, Bitlanders focuses on giving money to charity as well. So while it's a for-profit, there's a there's a nonprofit element of it. But are there other people using Bitcoin in games, and how is it different from what you guys are doing? Um, in this specific field, there is not uh, much project, but there are um, there are um, several work uh, around a digital world um, for RPGs, MMORPGs, where uh, you can uh, find Bitcoin, you can earn Bitcoin. Um, there are some initiatives. Um, if I'm correct, there is no uh, official company that is registered who are working on uh, on um, such uh, such project. So um, we, maybe I'm wrong, but I think we are the uh, only company, uh, incorporate company, uh, who do games using the blockchain. Um, there is a lot of good ideas out there. Um, and the uh, very interesting fact in uh, using the blockchain is that you, it's easy to make partnership. You can say, hey, um, you're building a completely different game uh, where you can purchase, I don't know, a house in uh, a, your specific game and we can say, hey, we can reuse this, we make a partnership, we reuse this same asset in Spells of Genesis. So then we act as a complement. So when you win something in game A, you can unlock something on uh, Spells of Genesis, for example. So, uh, so far, um, all uh, initiative, all games are, are very different, and there is no um, uh, games that are close to uh, to spells of Genesis, but in long term, what I want to uh, to develop um, is to go to a platform to be more like a platform where people can um, digitalize or blockchainize, tokenize their uh, their game asset, and being able to. Um, to uh, uh, bring the gap between the, the different game and the, uh, the different asset you can own in game and make a platform where you can share 
uh, with other other game um, uh, certain assets that would be usable in different ones. Okay, so you know one of the things about Bitcoin that I didn't realize was how much control people who work on computers actually have over the world. I made friends with this hacker guy and he started telling me all the stuff that they have access to and what exactly they're working on and it seems like they own the world. Um, one of the things that I was also thinking about when you're talking about this game is wouldn't this be a great way to onboard people into Bitcoin? But then I wonder what the population is of gamers to Bitcoin users and I would think that the gamers would already be kind of into Bitcoin anyway. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, I. I think there's probably a few million Bitcoiners around the world, you know, one to five million. And the number of gamers, you know, 100 million, maybe more so, than that. So that would be good, right? If they if they all started getting into it in this way, wouldn't that help with mass adoption? Yeah, I think a pretty small percentage of people who play video games are familiar with, uh, with Bitcoin or involved in any way. Uh, it's a far, far larger market, and so if 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 these kind of initiatives like what Shaban is doing um, help people learn about essentially digital assets, which I think it inevitably will, these people are already used to understanding that an item can have real value even though it's digital. So it's more just about the interface that they start to understand and learning what you know an address is that you send a, a transaction to and getting comfortable with that side of things. And uh, absolutely, that'll bring that'll bring millions and millions of people into um, into the Bitcoin world. Yeah, I agree. Um, within our community, among the players, um, even it's a hardcore uh, community. Uh, some have a very hard time understanding Bitcoin. And um, so far, um, the tools that we have are a little bit uh, complex, even for people who are used to. Uh, to, uh, to computers, and one of our mission is also to simplify the experience for, uh, for the user. So uh, within Spells of Genesis, it will be completely transparent for the user. When, when he starts the learning curve and all these assets, uh, instead of uh, viewing a wallet uh, with complica complicated a key or uh, questioning where's my private key, where's my public key, they just open the game and see their profile and see their assets and have a button to press um, to, uh, to, uh, to send a card to a friend, for example, without uh, having to, um, to understand this, uh, this uh, public and private key. So this is a way where we want to, uh, to, to head because all those gamers, they are not like uh, we are uh, early adopters, uh, passionate by the technology itself. Um, they are interested in the use, and they don't care about how the technology works. They just want to own their asset and trade it. So uh, there is a big work um, since to, uh, to to be done in order to simplify this whole experience and. Shapeshift, um, if we really love to uh, work with Shapeshift because their interface uh, and the way they handle um, uh, conversion looks very easy and uh, usable for, for the white public. Do these tokens live in a tokenly, the digital assets being created, do they live in the tokenly wallet? Do they live in Spells of Genesis or in a form of a tokenly wallet in the Spells of Genesis thing? And then the second part is if tokenly is being used for at least part of this whole process, wouldn't those uh, tokens also or the digital assets be built on counterparty sort of like anything else, almost like Bitcoin, counterparty, Spells of Genesis, digital assets, but all along that stream and then being related to, to counterparty? Yes. Um, from a user point of view, um, um, it, it will be uh, transparent. So like Tokenly, uh, the wallet will be um, 
inside uh, inside the game directly. But it's or, your wallet. Like, could you send bitcoins out of your wallet or no? And yes. is it in house? Yes. Yeah. It, yes. It's it's just a counterparty. It's a layer of interface on top of a counterparty wallet. So this is uh, the the way we uh, we envision it is to have a layer um, of interface of simplification, um, a little bit like Tokenly uh, wallet does, um, uh, on top of uh, counterparty. So. Uh, instead of viewing your asset as a name, for example, uh, a list of asset names, uh, you see your asset as cards. So if you have uh, 10 cards, um, instead of viewing their card name, you see their little picture of the card. And if you want to send a card to someone, you will be prompt to their um, Spells of Genesis username or public uh, address. But all this, um, all this complexity uh, will be um, uh, tried to be hidden from the user, uh, while the power user can do can use the same kind of wallet uh, or Bitcoin wallet or uh, the way he used to uh, to do the trading already. Yeah, okay, be... so they can start trading from there too if they wanted to. Yeah. So yeah. it's like you have a blockchain.info wallet or a tokenly info or a counter wallet. Uh, it wouldn't be a blockchain.info because that wouldn't hold counterparty tokens. But it would be a counterparty wallet of some sort that you guys built yourself on top of it. Yeah. Okay. It's just, just an interface, actually. It worked the same. And people are able to play the game now, right? Um, so for Spells of Genesis, we have a pre-alpha uh, demo. Um, that people can try by registering on the website. Uh, for Munga, our previous game, um, it's playable for years now, and we just started connecting to uh, connected Munga to the blockchain. So, uh, asset that you purchase for Spells of Genesis are playable in uh, two different games, the two games that we are uh, uh, publishing. Can you briefly walk me through what um, your campaign, you know, putting it together looked like? What were some of the challenges that you guys did? What do you think were some of the good decisions that you've made and some of the bad? You know, what would you have changed about it? Um, we do we do something um, in the campaign um, is more than giving bits crystal with the uh, game currency that we're selling during our token sale we are giving um, some other gifts that are uh, pretty interesting um, like the partnership the partner ranks um, will allow people uh, participating in the token sale to uh, achieve a lifetime um, uh, rank that open um, stores to be like resellers. So basically, a partner um, can act like a, a reseller, and he will have access to uh, some cards or or game assets that we are not selling to the wide public. And this uh, this way, he um, will be able to open his. Do his own trade, and then he will uh, push and um, push and promote his shop, and ultimately it will benefit for Spells of Genesis in general because we're using um, the uh, the common power, the group power, um, to promote the uh, the game. So it's a good deal for them because they have access to assets. Um, that other people don't have, and they can resell and make some mar margin on that. A little bit like real. Uh, in different location to um, to push and promote their their product. So this is something interesting. 
um, we implemented in the uh, in the uh, token sale. Um, um, also, uh, what are the bad thing? Uh, what are the bad thing, or what we could have done better? Yeah, like what challenges did you guys find out about? Because I know when I made Tatiana Coin, it was just one dead body under another that I just kept finding under a rock. You know, there were a lot of um, things that I didn't see coming. So I guess that's that's the question to clarify. Um, so th there was one very important thing, um, very important decision was are we accepting um, uh, fiat currency, the US dollar, PayPal, uh, whatever, because our user base, our fans who are playing Munga, um, they are used to, uh, to use PayPal and um, the uh, regular thing. And we decided not to accept this, even that it cuts us from our uh, a big uh, user base who don't own Bitcoin and who don't want to take time to, uh, uh, to, uh, to look at it. So this is a very uh, major uh, difficulty because we kind of splitted our, our user base and say, okay, um, this is only for people who, um, who want to use Bitcoin. And um, the legal framework um, refrain us to, uh, to accept fiat currency since uh, digital assets uh, status is unclear. So we prefer to uh, play safe and um, not accept uh, fiat currency. So this is um, one of the, the, um, the big uh, challenge that we have in the digital world how we can bring people who are not familiar with crypto uh, into a project that might in interest them. Yeah, that's been, a, that's been a big challenge to me, and I think that one of the cool things would be to integrate the ability to buy Bitcoin for fiat. I mean, there's the two- or three-day turnaround time, but I don't know if you guys are familiar with the project Lidera. I learned about that at Chicago Inside Bitcoins, and what they're doing is that they're allowing... People, for example, um, if somebody wanted to buy Tatiana coin and they, di you know, didn't, maybe they can figure out how to use a tokenly wallet. But right now, I have to say, okay, we'll go to Coinbase, give them your firstborn, and then in three days you might get some Bitcoin. So, you know, I mean, it's like a, it's a torturous process. They're not going to remember, and that's been a big impedance to me as well. Um, and then the other option that we came across with was you know, allowing them to buy a certain limited number of coins and if they do something messed up, well, whatever. I mean, it's Tatiana coin. I have a finite amount of them, but it's not like there's two of them left and I'm just holding on to them for dear life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess I could take that risk. But since you guys are doing something on such a higher scale, is that why you weren't able to do it? Because you were worried about people gaming the system, maybe sending you PayPal and then reversing it type thing? Um, yes. There is a lot of um, of issues uh, using PayPal, the the, the reverse uh, the reverse thing, um, and also uh, legally um, in Switzerland, if you are selling Bitcoin or fiat, you are a money transmitter, and you have to uh, apply to uh, to license, and it's not our core business. Um, being money transmitter, so um, we didn't want to uh, to 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 focus on on that. And as it's for the crowd sale, we are targeting early adopters or people who are into uh, who are able to understand the potential of it. Um, so we decided to go just Bitcoin because those uh, people understand it pretty well already. But when it will come to uh, the public release, product release, we will definitely um, work in partnership with uh, other company who can uh, simplify the process for the user. Uh, we want always to have something transparent. So um, if they need some Bitcoin or um, need some digital asset for them, should be very simple. Um, 
they just put their credit card or or do the process they are used to, and they receive the asset without uh, having to uh, to think too much and to understand too much about uh, how a wallet works. And this is the the big challenge ahead of us. Yeah, I think that that's really where things start to become really stressful and annoying, almost to the point where I don't even know how people can manage to try and do businesses um, in Bitcoin in the first place. Uh, obviously, Shapeshift, you guys were one of the first people to say, we're not going to New York, screw this, um, which I actually thought was a really great way to do it. I know that some people will be able to do it, but when I sat in on an explanation of BitLicense, there was an attorney and any question that anybody had for him, he had no answers to. And imagine you're paying this guy $500 an hour and every response that he tells you is, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. It's actually really a big turn off just like logically, you know, uh, and I can only imagine how terrifying it would be genuinely as a business to try and work in New York because you really have no idea what they're going to try and do to you. Now, you guys are not based um, in New York, so from what I understand, though, they can still, if you were, you know, let's say people are paying, playing sales of Genesis and you're registered in another country, with a regular game, uh, I'm sorry, with a regular company that would somehow accidentally do business in New York, they also want them to get a license, which is bananas because what, every single, con you know, Bitcoin company in the world has to go to New York and pay $5,000 just for the application and then $30,000, $100,000 minimum for their attorney fees. That's bananas. So how are you guys dealing with that? Like what if somebody wants to play Spells of Genesis and they're on, you know, 34th Street? What happens? Um, so, so far, uh, to tell the truth, is under undetermined. Um, we'll first, uh, first thing first, we'll see how other company manage um, how this uh, thing is going on. Since it's not an American company, um, we uh, will be less, we will have uh, less trouble than people that are on um, operating directly in the US. So we are um, gonna wait and see on this uh, specific uh, specific problem. See how people deal with that and try to find uh, a solution. And the worst solution will be a ban a New York uh, a New York citizen to uh, to uh, to play Spells of Genesis. Um, Eric, what do you have to say about all that stuff? And and is something is this something that Shapeshift needs to worry about? Um, I feel like Shapeshift does a lot of things that are kind of wild, which is why I like it. But do you? How do you manage the the risk of the regulators torturing you um, to death? <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, a an entrepreneur in the Bitcoin world has to be comfortable stepping into the legal unknown. Because even if you want to be, you know, a, a full statist and comply with every silly rule that a bureaucrat throws at you, uh, even when you go to the lawyers, um, they can't always tell you. They, and as you said, they often will just give you a, you know, I don't know. And if you really push them, they'll say, well, then you can't do it. So there's this huge chilling effect that regulators have, um, and I don't think they quite realize it. They, you know, a regulator probably understands that if they write rules against something, it, it chills that something. But they don't realize that just by discussing an industry and and potentially regulating it in some way, uh, there's a huge amount of cost that goes into every business that's looking in that industry. Just, just talking to lawyers or just trying to figure out what their own internal policies are going to be. So yeah, it's, it, it sucks. Um, the fact that, that a Swiss company like like uh, EverDreamSoft has to be thinking about uh, New York State financial regulations when they are just building a, a video game that people play for entertainment. The fact that they have to think about that uh, is very indicative of how screwed up I think the the U.S. regulatory system is. Um, and you know who who knows how it'll turn out, but ultimately 
I think New Yorkers are going to be a sort of a second-class citizens for a while while the uh, the crypto innovation moves on without them. Well, I think it's going to be pretty embarrassing. You know, you bring up a good point. I mean, do people... I mean, does he now have to worry about every single country in the world being, I mean, you know, in the state of New York? Um, but do you have to be worried, okay, well, in France, are they going to come and arrest me next time I go the, over to the Eiffel Tower? Or if you go to um, Hong Kong, you know, is are you going to have problems there? I mean, do, does a company, because they work in crypto, now have to be considerate of, considerate of every single regulation in every single place on earth? I mean, that's ridiculous. So wouldn't New York be setting a completely, I mean, frankly, stupid standard? Yeah, w wisdom is not is not the policy by which they figure out their course of action, though. Um, Don't they get they, that though? I mean, this is. No, I mean, they, they're statists. They're they're a bunch of statists. They think that the world runs because of the rules that they have penned, and um, they don't realize that that the things they do hold back an entire industry um, from building really cool stuff. Uh, stuff that is, you know, everything from entertainment to seriously financially important to to millions of people around the world. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's terrible, and I I think Bitcoin and blockchain technology in general raises so many interesting questions that are difficult for uh, regulators to handle. Everything from you know jurisdiction to to what constitutes money. Um, it raises so many of these interesting questions that it's going to force a very important dialogue to happen, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Uh, and I, I expect a long struggle. I mean, this is sort of going to be a defining battle of our generation is is trying to figure out if people have the right to transact with each other uh, free of censorship, free of coercion, uh, free of surveillance, or, or not. Or, or, you know, and every regulator would prefer the latter. Um, so it's really going to be about people kind of waking up and, and realizing that there's some really amazing technology sitting right outside their door, and all they need to do is kind of stand up and, and start using it. Um, but, of course, be be comfortable with a little bit of legal uncertainty. Yeah, but that legal uncertainty can be utilized to throw people in jail for having unpopular political speech. Yeah. You know, I mean... I well, think that that would be a reason that I would be concerned. You know, when you talk about people being able to make money off of spells of Genesis in terms of having access to the store and being able to get wholesale prices, and then they can make money on top of it, I mean, that's so innovative and really awesome. I really had my doubts about this whole video game thing, but you guys are luring me in. <laughs> but wouldn't the SEC and whatever other torture regimes want to say, well, you can't do that because, I mean, I would think that you're just opening yourself up to a whole bunch of crap. Well, n nothing worth doing is easy. Man. But, I mean, yeah. the thing is, is that what's, what's interesting about it is that, you know, as an investor, you say, okay, well, I can make an investment in something like a Bitcoin company of any kind, really, or I can invest in something else that may also have the same, um, you know, like growth potential, whatever, that just doesn't have the uh, the risk associated with it. And that just seems really sad. I wonder what is the, the thought process. Okay, obviously, you know, um, I don't know how Siobhan is, but Eric and I are kind of on the freedom team, right? So... Aside from the typical label of saying, oh, well, they're status, they're stupid, I mean, that's not a really good way to relate with people and to understand their motivations. I think that understanding their motivation is is an important component for breaking down that wall between the two people. And I think that they think that they're doing a good thing, but is it also possible that they're all evil? Like, what percentage of them is evil and completely blind to the fact that they're doing something bad? I mean, where does that break down in you guys' mind? I don't. I don't think they're evil. I don't think the average regulator is evil. They, they think that they're doing good things. They think that they're helping the world. They think that they're making it uh, safer and better and and more fair and, and all sorts of. Um, Have they just been know. propagandized? No, they're just, they're just that? they're just wrong. People are wrong about all sorts of things. I'm sure I'm wrong about some things. Uh, the difference, of course, is that the things I'm wrong about, I don't force upon other people, whereas <laughs> the the regulator does. Um, but I, you know, they, 
these people are generally good people. They just they they think that it's okay to force other people to do what they want. They think it's okay to use coercion to uh, to compel their opinions upon other people. Uh, how did they grow up that way? How you know because their their parents thought that too because most people grow up in public education and you you salute the flag and you you learn that markets fail and regulators save them and you learn all this you know propaganda that's not governed by s some evil uh, group that's causing this this conspiracy it's just a, it's like a it's like a mental it's like a mental disease that that people that society has just as um, there have been lots of you know kind of social diseases over time people think things that are wrong and at times those are very popular beliefs um, you know and I, I like to call you know the, the the fight for Bitcoin is the separation of money and state and you know obviously that refers to the separation of church and state that was you know pro more controversial than what we're trying to do now the idea that that the state should not govern uh, how people um, have their have their religious beliefs you know that was that was a hard won battle, and, and the average people back in those days, they they believed in the structure at the time, and so it took society a long time to move away from that. Um, and you know, it's people are not going to move away from the uh, state control of financial systems very easily either. But for the same reason that people have the right to to be free in their religion, they they ought to be free in their uh, in their transactions and their finances as well. You know, I agree with everything that you said except that, and I'm not genuinely trying to be conspiratorial, I feel like that's a way to turn people off, but that agenda is set by somebody. It's not like everybody just went to school and they're like, I don't know, what should we do? Should we, maybe we could salute the flag. That's a great idea, Bob. And then they start saluting. I mean, somebody came up with that as part of the, uh, you know, process, right? And I think that well, that's really where we run into issues because we have this massive ability to tell people what to think whereas before people were segregated they barely had telephones much less the internet so now it's almost like a massive um, melding of the minds into whatever X person or X group of people says that they should be thinking about well just just as people that understand markets I think understand the concept of spontaneous order where markets aren't based on some central entity guiding them toward producing things that are useful it, it's a spontaneous process and in the same way that societies have spontaneous order develop in certain ways they absolutely have spontaneous uh, disorder you know concepts and dynamics that spontaneously happen that aren't necessarily good and I think uh, I think the desire to control other people uh, is is one of those and, and causes the the statism that we all have to deal with so how do you guys sleep at night with just really good lawyers or you think about <laughs> the positive stuff that could potentially come out of this? I think what, uh, what it drives is uh, the, we cannot be driving drive by fear. Um, being an entrepreneur is like jumping into the the nowhere. Um, so we, <laughs> so so it's a part of the uh, the fun because innovators take risk, and at some points we have to um, to jump into uh, into the thing. Yeah, I I've got plenty of lawyers, of course, but I don't sleep well at night because of the lawyers. I sleep well at night because I know that I'm doing something important. And you know, even even if it's scary, and even if the the state might like to hurt me and take my stuff and ruin my ruin my days, um, you know, I, I hope to have lived a life that I can look back on and, and say, yeah, I, I I built things that were useful to people, and I, I didn't cower in fear uh, at the government that was in front of me. Um, I like you guys' attitude. I think that's good. Um, I recently started a business, Crypto Media Hub, and then, you know, Tatiana Coin was totally weird. And it's really remarkable to me just how many roadblocks there are because of the state in terms of expenses for your company and everything like that. So that's been a, I don't know, I feel like people out there should be doing more entrepreneurship, but it is really, really difficult and unnecessarily so. Like, I think that there are already inherent things in that that are super difficult but then to also have that um, additional component which easily makes up 30 percent of your torture that you have to deal with um, so 
I don't know. It, it's just hard. I admire what you guys are trying to do, and I think that it's really cool. Uh, real quick, what do you all think about this whole XT debacle? Oh, we're not allowed to talk about that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> uh, why? Because everybody else is talking about it 24-7? No, because it's censored. Didn't you get the memo? No, I didn't. No. Oh, oh. Wait, are you serious? <laughs> You're going to be in trouble. You're going to oh, be God. in trouble. <laughs> so Joshi's coming to get me. Um, <laughs> so is Bitcoin doomed? I guess that's my question. No, of course Bitcoin isn't doomed. I, I, I'm pretty much of the opinion that there are a lot of uh, decent paths forward regarding the block size debate. Uh, I don't, I don't know that any of them are um, terminally bad. Uh, you know, they, they, they will change and shape the way that Bitcoin is used, but, but none of them, uh, none of them kill Bitcoin. So it's, it's one of many growing pains that, that Bitcoin has to, to face and get through. And I see no reason why it won't. I did not appreciate the price drop, for the record, at all. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's been such a brutal couple of years with the price. I mean, some people are like, who cares about the price? Like, I do. I need money. <laughs> yeah, I, I, care <laughs> about, I care Bitcoin. about the price, too. Yeah. I, you know. I, care I don't about get those people. Those people are snobs. I don't listen to those people. When they say that, I'm like, forget it. I'm not listening to you at all about anything anymore. But, but um, I mean, I would like to see price. it go up. Yeah. Well, it, ultimately, you know, people just need to take a long-term view of it, right? I mean, Bitcoin is not something that happens in a year or in five years. It is a, you know, it's a technology that completely changes the world, and that's that's something that happens, uh, you know, in a in a decade or two. And if you if you have your time horizon as you know more than just several months or a year, uh, Bitcoin's still doing tremendously well. It has been the the best performing asset since it started. There's nothing else that has achieved the returns that Bitcoin has since its foundation. And uh, even though it, it goes up and crashes and causes a lot of uh, misery for the people who buy at the wrong times, um, as long as you're buying because you understand what it is, you know, it is a it is a piece of a technology that is that is likely going to change the world, but there are tons of risks, and uh, it's not for the faint of heart. I, I totally agree with that. I'm never anti-Bitcoin, but I definitely can get grumpy when the price goes down, especially when people are asking me, hey, what's the price of Bitcoin? And I have to tell them, and then they're like, oh, Bitcoin must be screwed. And I have yeah. to explain to them, no, it's not. Trust me, relax, simmer down. Uh, and then, you know, we had all this stuff with the markets, the past couple days um, crashing and burning to the ground and I guess the gold price is down which is arguably manipulated and stuff but I mean maybe that would do good for Bitcoin I'm not really sure yeah well, <laughs> all, all financial assets move around uh, there's no such thing as stability in prices and uh, it's just a question of to what extent something is volatile and everyone should expect something like Bitcoin to be volatile for a while um, you know, as as always, people should not put their life savings into Bitcoin if they can't afford to lose it. And now you tell me. <laughs> I've been saying that forever. I, you've you know that message. That's an important one. But for for example, for our token sale, it uh, changes the games a lot uh, according to the the price. Um, yeah. It's it's a huge uh, huge difference, and the whole strategy and the whole way I will need to allocate my resources will really uh, uh, changing with the price. So it's also it makes me a little bit grumpy as well. <laughs> okay, good. Well, we can be grumpy together. <laughs> uh, so, are you guys coming to any conferences coming up, or what's the plan? When is the sale over? How is that running, Shaban? So it's over next Friday, Friday um, the fourth uh, or the three. I'm not completely sure, but uh, next week it's uh, it's over. And after the sale, we're gonna distribute the bit crystals to everyone and the other gifts like the lifetime ranks and uh, limited edition cards uh, and so on. So um, yeah, if uh, you want to participate, it's not too late. Um, you have uh, one week to go. Um, I think uh, so some people are focusing on the cards rewards like the Satoshi. Um, I think um, the, uh, the 
the partner ranks are very interesting because it opens um, access to uh, different uh, shops to be uh, resellers, and that's uh, exciting. I, I think it's exciting opportunity um, on parties banking to uh, to this stock and sale. Uh, price down with standing, how much have you raised so far? Um, eight eight hundred and fifty Bitcoin. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's quite a bit. And then when would the game actually be launching? When am I basically going to get to create my own Tatiana avatar and play a video game for the first time in twenty years? So in December you're gonna have a for good, Christmas. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have a good preview, and the uh, final polished product will be a uh, uh, beginning of. Uh, next summer. Okay, cool. I think I could wait that long. What about you, Eric? Are you uh, are you gonna play Spells of Genesis? <laughs> Hell yeah! Yeah, we we actually have a there's a shapeshift card. Like, so there's a game asset that uh, Shaban was nice enough to create for us. That's the shapeshift. It's called Shapeshift Wanderer, and it's like a special card in the game. Um, so I want one of those. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's all sorts of fun stuff that that can be done, and so there's only ever going to be a thousand of these cards, you know. And we've been selling some of them on the site, and they give special powers within the game. And some people will buy them to to play them in the game, but they are real financial assets, and so other people buy them just to speculate or to trade later on, uh, if they believe the value will be higher or lower. Um, so yeah, it's it's very interesting. I feel like there should be some more, uh, you know doctorate theses uh, written about these kind of things in, in business schools and all that. Uh, I actually think it's it's much more compelling than I thought it was going to be. It's actually pretty big deal. Uh, I'd like to say to all the people that are listening that are going to be playing Spells of Genesis, please uh, consider perhaps making a card about me. And here's, here's the secret power, right? I would go up to people and I would sing and then they would kind of fall asleep and then you could sneak past them to the next level. <laughs> kind of like a siren. Oh, brilliant. Just Pretty putting it out there. I mean, you know, people are thinking about it. You can't have this game only be for guys. You have to have, a, a you know, more and more girls in the game. Are, yeah. Do you think a lot of the people that are playing, what percentage are, are guys that are interested in this and what percentage are women? We have 15% of uh, a woman. In, oh, that's uh, not so bad. Base, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, Shaban, are you speaking at any conferences anytime soon? Um, not nothing decided yet. Okay. Well, we uh, I hope to see you sometime and, and meet you in person. How about you, Eric? What's up on the uh, agenda for you? Uh, just working on Shapeshift. Um, no, no big travel plans in the near future. So, uh, just got to keep building. Is there anything new and exciting about Shapeshift that's coming up that's... I mean, I feel like the functionality is really awesome and really straightforward, but are there any kind of new developments that you guys are planning? You don't have to tell me if it's we, secret, but... We had, an awesome, we had an awesome idea last week that's going to totally revolutionize the world, but I <laughs> definitely cannot talk about it right now. Is it true? Is that a true thing? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I have something to look forward to besides the price going up. Yeah, but but Ben Lasky called and said we can't do it. So sorry, world, you, you won't get to have it anymore. He's so annoying. He's always breaking up the party. He's yeah. like when your parents come home. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Ben Lasky is. Um, yeah, except except I actually love my parents and they helped my life quite a bit. And he's just imposing his will upon everyone who is not his progeny. Oh well, yeah. Screw that guy then. Yeah, I he's mean, not like, Ben Lasky, like, you're awesome. Don't worry, I definitely like you. In case you're not like parents at all. <laughs> not like parents at all. Um, that's funny. All right, well, listen, guys, this has been very cool. Tell me where people can find out more about your stuff. Uh, Shaban, where can people buy these SOG coins? I was like, what is this SOG thing? It means spells of Genesis if people <laughs> don't know. Oh, and we need a magic word, too. So maybe, Shaban, you want to make up the magic word and then tell us where they can get their uh, access to their revolutionary new game? Uh... Yes, uh, yes. Um, so, uh, magic code. Um, uh, magic code. Magic word. Uh, I've gotten a whole bunch of BS from the LTV audience for not being clear. I said secret word. They're like, it's not the secret word. It's the magic word. <laughs> <laughs> so, just make sure you don't piss them off, because otherwise you're not going to win. Uh, magic token. 
is a good word. Magic token. Two words for the foreigners is it's M A G I C space T O K E N. Eric, wait, no, Shaban, where can they go? Where can they get these tokens? Um, we are we. Oh, we're, so we we are building um, some magic uh, tokens and uh, using this in the token sale page will um, give um, re um, discounts on the bit crystal and also uh, offers uh, 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 some magic tokens of our own, uh, especially for for people who triggered this uh, magic word. And so it's uh, a website. It's on uh, bitcrystals.com, www.bitcrystals with an S dot com. Otherwise, uh, all information is also findable on um, spellsofgenesis.com. Very cool. That's awesome. And Eric, what about you? Where can people find Shapeshift and find out more about what you're doing? Uh, Shapeshift.io is our URL. And on Wednesday, in two days, we are releasing another 25 of the special Shapeshift Spells of Genesis cards. So they tend to go very quickly. Um, we haven't released what time we're going to put them up yet, but if you subscribe to our newsletter, we will definitely tell you and just watch our tweets. Uh, so Wednesday, Shapeshift.io, you can buy these cards with any kind of cryptocurrency, and uh, it will it will absolutely make your day. Can I use Tatiana <laughs> Coin to buy them? No, not yet. Not it. Not we. We don't have any every coin, every really? digital asset. All right, you got me. Thoughts there or representation? Are... I'm going to Lasky. There. <laughs> oh crap! All right. Well, we'll get Tatiana Coin up there, and then you can buy it. I hope so. This has been so fun, guys. I genuinely didn't know how it was going to go, but uh, I definitely want to try the game really soon. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thank you to Liberty.me crew for always being so kind and uh, helping me set this up and supporting all of this stuff. Let's talk Bitcoin audience. Y'all are my homies. I hope to get this episode up by Wednesday, especially for that specific uh, promotion. But if they don't get it, please don't hurt me. Uh, check me out at TatianaMoroz.com. You can find out about Tatiana Coin there. Or if you need advertising or marketing or PR for Bitcoin, go to CryptoMediaHub.com. We will be back next week on... Monday night at 9 p.m. live. I don't know who our guest is going to be. I'm vaguely considering taking off for the summer, but I'll try not to be lazy and bring you guys some good stuff, as always. Thank you very much for listening, and thanks very much to our guests. Thank thanks you. Everyone. Take care. Thank peace you. everyone. Thank oh, you. and also, more episodes are found on uh, letstalkbitcoin.com in the archives on my blog, and also at liberty.me, so all of the old episodes, you can catch up on that, too. Thanks, everyone. Peace out. Bye. Thanks. Bye.